Hello, I'm Yannick Maus, and I will talk today about distributed vertex coloring and about classic meets modern. In particular, I want to talk about this very recent result from this year's DISC. It's a result which I wanted to show since this seminal paper by Frenier, Heinrich, and Kosowski from Fox 16. And even so, the techniques and uh, the result is very related to this paper. I hope the authors don't get defended if I don't talk about the relation to this paper today, because in my opinion, this deserves a completely separate talk of yeah, maybe also one hour. Instead, I want to relate this result to other classic results in the area. So just a few words. This is a distributed algorithm. It's deterministic. It uses almost small messages, and it also works for list coloring. So what's the structure of this talk? First, I want to zoom out a bit and tell you a bit about the surroundings of this result. Where do you, should you locate this result? Then I will zoom in to this result and then at the end I will conclude. So let's start with zooming out a bit. So the setting that we have here is distributed computing in large networks. So we have such a large network and a single node in this network has no global information. Instead, it just has some partial local information and because it can never see the whole network. So, for example, it can just see some, yeah, get some information from vertices that are close to it in this network. But still, we want to compute something which is ki some kind of a global solution of the whole network. For example, a completely like global valid coloring. So optimally, what we want to have here, if these networks are really large, that the information that you need to compute this global solution of one vertex should be uh, small. and The radius of this should be as small as possible. And it's even better if this radius here only depends on local parameters and not so much and the size of the network itself. So while this is very high level here, let's make this a bit more concrete and look at the model that we use here. This is a standard local model introduced by Matthew Daniel in 1987, and I will talk about deterministic algorithms. This is, we have such a communication network and it's abstracted as a graph, and each node in this graph has a unique ID from some ID space, which is polynomial in the number of nodes. And then these vertices communicate with each other and they communicate in discrete synchronous rounds. So in one round, a vertex can perform some local computation and exchange messages with all of its neighbors. So these messages are not bounded in size and also local computations are not bounded and we do not charge the vertices for these local computations. So the only complexity measure of our algorithms is the number of synchronous rounds until we've solved some problem. So this immediately refers to the radius of this ball that you've seen in the previous picture. This is the complexity of an algorithm. How far does information have to travel to uh, compute the output of a vertex? And the problems that we want to solve here are also given just on this communication network. So the communication network is also the problem instance itself. And problems that we want to solve are classic graph problems, for example, like vertex coloring. As for example, we want to compute the proper coloring, meaning every node should output the color such that adjacent vertices output different colors. And yeah, you the crux here is that actually at the start, a node doesn't know the topology of the network, just knows its own ID, and then they have to communicate it to actually coordinate their actions. And usually what we want to do in this setting is to compute a delta plus one coloring, where delta is the maximum degree of the graph. This is because any graph has a delta plus one coloring, and it's also very simple to compute it sequentially with a simple greedy element. We just iterate through the vertices in an arbitrary order. The vertex can always pick a free color because at most delta colors are blocked by its already colored neighbors. You can pick a color, and just color the graph gradually. 
And actually, one thing which hasn't got much attention so far is uh, what's going to be important in this talk, or at least in the technical parts of this talk, is this initial knowledge of a node and what can you do with it. So, for example, what can you solve with some with this initial knowledge. Some things you can solve trivially without any communication. For example, consider the problem of every node has to output a unique ID. Well, you know your unique ID, you just output it. Or for example, you want to compute the coloring and the number of colors is the same as the size of the ID space. Everyone can just output their ID and you have a coloring. And this will play a role in the technical parts later in the talk. So let's zoom out a little bit more because of course in this area one doesn't have studied just graph coloring, but in particular a lot of the research has focused on these four problems, maximal independent set, maximal matching, vertex and edge coloring. So maximal independent set is just an inclusion, maximal independent set, maximal matching is a inclusion maximal matching and yeah already explained vertex current edge current is the same problem on the edges on the line graph basically there are reductions between these problems and they've been studied a lot so let's see a little bit what's the state of the art for these problems now because we've seen a lot of progress in the last couple of years and i will focus on deterministic progress here even so we've also seen a lot of randomized progress and actually deterministic and randomized progress are tied together very closely for this, these problems, even to the extent that if you want to improve randomized algorithms, you also have to improve deterministic algorithms. So deterministic algorithms really are important. And one area that people have looked at a lot is the complexity as a function of n, the number of nodes. And what we now know due to big breakthrough from this year is that all of these problems have polylogarithmic deterministic polylogarithmic in n deterministic algorithms. And this is usually considered efficient. It was a really big breakthrough to have this result. But uh, the solution is a very generic solution. It's even so generic that you cannot just solve these four problems with it, but using prior work, you can solve a very large class of problems. Actually, I won't detail on this, it's not the topic of this talk, but you can solve all problems which are locally checkable where you can check the validity of a solution locally by a local algorithm efficiently. And you have an efficient randomized algorithm. All of these can also solve efficiently with different deterministic algorithms now. On the downside, these very generic solutions here can never go below a runtime of log squared. And this is why for some problems, and this even already happened before this breakthrough, people have developed specific algorithms for these problems. And you, I don't want to detail on these problems, but one thing that you can notice here is both of these problems, maximum matching here and edge coloring down here, they have a single log n factor in the runtime and the rest of the complexity depends on delta. And in general, one might ask, can we also find algorithms where we don't have any complexity on, on depending on n, but the whole complexity just depends on the maximum degree delta or on other local parameters. And that's a long and probably the oldest result in, uh, that shows that this is not possible. Actually, all of these algorithms have a lower bound of omega of log star n bounds. Log star is a function which is much smaller than log n. And this is why people also considered the regime where we just limit the runtime depending on n to this log star. <coughs> so you're allowed to spend this log star n rounds, which is necessary, and the rest of the runtime should depend on local parameters. And here the main local parameter that is used is the maximum degree. And this has this regime of complexities has also seen a lot of research. And since 10 and 20 years, we actually have uh, efficient, or I don't know whether I should call them efficient, but we have linear and delta algorithms actually for all four problem, problems. But since the state of the art for the coloring problems is even better now, I didn't uh, extend this rectangular box here to the bottom. But the very interesting 
interesting is that from a result from last year, you also know that this is tied for MIS and maximal matching. So this there is no sub small o of delta plus small o of log n over log log n result here, algorithm for these. This actually means if you limit your dependency on n to log star of n, you will spend linear and delta time for these problems. So basically, this regime is answered for MIS and maximal matching. We have tight answers here. This is very different for the current problems. Here we have the currently best algorithms and uh, are roughly square root delta and this quasi polylog for edge coloring. I didn't put any citations here because I will talk about this vertex coloring result here. And then as in a different ADCA talk, we talk about this edge coloring result. But here, we really don't have any lower bounds. So while in the picture rough here, with tight answers, we are far from tight answers down here. But let me summarize, why do we want to study this regime anyhow? Like if we zoom out again, because usually this f of n equals polylog n is considered efficient, but you really have a large global dependence on the size of the network. And if you really want to have a local algorithm, one can argue that the complexity and the radius of this ball should also just depend on local parameters only. And this has been researched before, and there are even problems where you have no dependence on n. These are mainly approximation problems. So fractional dominating set approximation or vertex cover approximation. These have algorithms where the runtime only depends on uh, delta. And you have, don't even have this log star of n dependence. But as I said before, for these four problems, we have a lower amount of log star of n that we cannot circumvent. This is why a big part of research studied this f of delta plus log star and complexity. And I want to point out that this is not really a formal definition here. Uh, and I think we haven't really discussed in the community what the formal definition should be here. Um, most of these algorithms, they first compute, use log star and time to compute the coloring. And afterwards, they don't use IDs anymore. So actually, one could also say another possibility to define these truly local algorithms of this regime that one wants to study here is that algorithms should work given an input coloring and they're not even allowed to use unique IDs. I think this makes sense in particular in large scale networks because for example the uniqueness of IDs cannot check, be checked locally. You can never know whether your ID appears in some other place again. But whether you have an input coloring or an input coloring which is unique in your color up to a certain distance, this is locally checkable. And yeah, last but not least, I want to also say there are also problems where the log star of n dependence is not enough. So for delta coloring, two delta minus two edge coloring, synchronous orientation or the Lovage local lemma, we need to spend even log n rounds to solve these problems. So let's look a little bit closer at graph coloring and let's begin with edge coloring. If so, Dennis will have a separate talk on edge coloring. I want to tell you a little bit, uh, well, you see that these are only a few results of the last three years. There's been a lot of research in, on this problem, in particular in the battle of finding this polylog n round algorithm. And first we had this polylog n round algorithm only uh, when we used more than two delta minus one colors. But then there was a polylog n round algorithm which used two delta minus one colors. And uh, then there's a generic solution. So this POC17 and POC19 are specific algorithms for coloring, edge coloring. This is the generic solution. But there's some interesting transition, phase transition that I want to tell you about here is if because graphs also, any graph by Weising's theorem also has an edge coloring with delta plus one colors only. This Weising's theorem is from the 60s, I think. And it's known that if you want to compute with less than two delta, coloring with less than two delta minus one colors, then you need at least omega of log n rounds. 
And it's very interesting that we now also have algorithms which can go below this threshold. So we have several algorithms, not all of them are polylog n rounds, but we have several algorithms which now can go below this threshold and we can go even all the way up to delta plus one color C. But of course, people have also studied this regime of f of delta plus log star n rounds, but uh, Dennis will talk more about this, I assume. Instead, let's look a little bit about this turbulent vertex coloring. And let's first again start with the complexity as a function of n. So here we basically have this breakthrough by Rosam and Kafari. And we have a similar phase transition here, that if we want to go below delta plus one colors, then we need log n rounds. But we also have algorithms which can compute colors, colorings with fewer than delta plus one colors, namely with delta colors. Of course, the graph should not be a clique because a clique needs delta plus one colors, a clique of size delta plus one. And it should also not be a cycle because in cycles, the problem has a linear lower bound. And uh, also on pass, cycles as pass. So delta has to be at least three for this result. Uh, but the more interesting thing that I want to point in here are the problem specific algorithms. While this result by Rosen Gaffari uses this generic approach to solve the problem, which can solve many, many problems, we also have algorithms which are really tech designed to solve the, uh, the vertex coloring problem. And you can see again that both of these algorithms here have just a single log n factor. So their dependency on n is better than the generic solution, which has a log squared dependence. But then they have a dependence uh, on delta. So if you color with significantly more colors with delta to the one plus epsilon, the dependence on delta, it's actually very small. It's just log delta. And if you want to go all the way down to delta plus one, a very recent result from this year, then you have a yeah, larger dependence. Um, but what I want to tell you here is why do we have this log n factor here? Or how does it come into these results? And the reason is that both of these results, they run algorithms which were designed to have a complexity that depends just on delta, on graphs which do not have a bounded degree, or, but on graphs which have a bounded out degree. And in this transition, when you have a graph which has a out degree, say, of beta, you can transform it into log n parts, which all have a degree of order of beta. And now in these papers, these parts are handled one after the other, which gives you a linear in, in a log n factor in the runtime. But now on these, each of these parts, you can run an algorithm, which is designed for a graph of bounded degree. So the reason this log n factor comes into these results is because we want to run an algorithm for bounded degree on a bounded out degree graph. And it's very inherent, I think, to these two algorithms, at least for general coloring. So I think even these specifically tailored uh, algorithms for the vertex coloring problem, which are very nice algorithms, they give us motivation that we should really understand what happens and what can we learn about the problem when we express the complexity as a function of the maximum degree. And this is what I want to talk about for the rest of the talk. So I want to talk about our result from this year's disk and different from our disk talk, I want to relate it a lot to classic results. So now let's zoom in to this result. And for everyone for which the start was a bit too much, let's just very quickly recap where we are. In the local model, we have a lot of algorithms which have the complexity as f of n. Now we're in the regime, complexity is f of delta, and only has this log star of n term. And just one last side remark before we actually start here with this, is some people also care about the congest model where messages are much smaller. 
And here we can almost meet, meet this uh, state of the art here. So we also have from this here POTSI, polylog n round congest algorithm, and there's also a sublinear in delta algorithm by Barenbaum from POTSI 15, which was actually the first sublinear algorithm. So let's see what's known about this particular regime. So first of all, this very classic lower bound that I've talked about by Daniel, which holds for coloring rings with constant number of colors. But then there's also a very classic upper bound by Daniel, and this upper bound will be important in this talk today. So this upper bound says in log star and rounds, you can compute an order of delta squared coloring for general graphs. So delta squared is much more than what we actually want, but it's very, very helpful. And sometimes on my slide, you see that I don't write order of log star or I just exactly write exact constants on this. And this is because from stock 93, um, yeah, there's a better algorithm which actually really cares about the constant in front of the log star. And then there are several results. First of all, this for delta plus one coloring, first of all, this algorithm by Daniel, it already implies an order of delta squared plus log star and algorithm by a process which is called simple color reduction. You take this delta squared coloring and you recolor one color class at a time. And basically it's a parallel version of this centralized greedy algorithm. And then if you parallelize this algorithm even further by recoloring several classes at the same time, you get an order of delta times log delta algorithm. And then in 2009, here I cited the journal version from five years later, Baron Bram, Alkin and Kuhn independently found the first linear and delta algorithm. This is based on defective coloring and we will also see a bit about this algorithm today. And then a simpler algorithm, at least I see, think it's simpler, also with linear and delta runtime was found two years ago. But I think at the time, like 2014, people conjectured maybe this linear delta is a lower bound and we also showed a lower bound, polynomial lower bound, polynomial and delta, but this is in a weaker model, in a weaker communication model where you cannot count basically. And not all of these previous algorithms here actually work in this model. But then history has shown that uh, we can actually get down to sublinear runtime. So here I've put the linear in delta runtime algorithms again, but then there were two sublinear algorithms. And today we have the third sublinear algorithm. And you can see the runtime improvement of this algorithm is minimal. And we only get rid of this log star delta term here. So I think the main contribution here is that putting all of these uh, algorithms into, yeah, we can almost say one framework or connecting the techniques back to this original algorithm by Daniel. And this is what I want to talk today about. So I first want to start with these classic algorithms here and what they have in common because they have, at least in hindsight, I think they have it's not maybe not written that way in the papers, but in hindsight, they have some very common structure. And then I will tell you how you can use this common structure to actually get a list coloring version of the Niels result. So of the above refers to the Niels color reduction algorithm up here. And then we can see how this actually leads to this roughly square of data algorithm. So first of all, we need to start with Linear's algorithm. And at the very core of Linear's algorithm is this one round color reduction process. So it takes an M input coloring and M is considered to be large and it computes an K output coloring where K is supposed to or should be much smaller than M and just takes one round. And for this to work, K has to be in roughly delta squared. I think you can, for most parts of the talk, ignore this log n here, but it has some dependence. And how do you get now Linear's result from this? You first take your D assignment, and this gives you the coloring with n colors, if you ID spaces of size capital M. And then you apply this linear color reduction iteratively until you at the very end are at roughly uh, order of delta squared colors. At the very last step here, you need to do an additional trick. So 
<clears throat> this takes roughly log stuff and iterations. So how does this one step algorithm here work? It's a very simple algorithm. It's just every node picks a candidate color set. I'll tell you later how you do this. So, and then you learn the candidate color sets of your neighbors, and then you pick a color. So here you can see each node has a candidate color set. You learn the candidate color sets of your neighbors and you pick a color which is not a candidate of one of your neighbors. So for this to work, you have to ensure that your candidate color set minus the candidate sets of your neighbors is not empty. So one way how to ensure it, how it's usually ensured is if you have so, a so-called low intersecting set family. So this is a set family. We have one set of candidate colors, so to say, for each input color. And these sets live in the output color space such that two of these sets have a small intersection and each set is large. Because if each set is large and they all have a small intersection, then if you remove all the intersection from one set, you have at least one color remaining. So if you have such a family, the algorithm works. And if you have one set for each input color, you can also hard code input colors to these sets. So basically, if you have such a family, you can solve this problem without any communication, just using your input colors or your ideas. How can you get such a family? Well, one way the linear had a proof using the probabilistic method and their constructions using polynomials that we will see later. But I want to tell you a greedy construction, which some has been known even before linear's work, but I think it has been missed by the distributed community. At least I've never seen this in any lecture notes, even so this is taught a lot. So you can just take the subspace or the space of all subsets of this fixed size the size that you want here. And then you just greedily pick sets. You pick the first set in the subset and you delete all conflicting sets. So <coughs> conflicting are the sets which have a too large intersection with your first sets. And then you repeat this. And if you choose the parameters correctly, then you can repeat this for n steps. And that this works is actually just a one line calculation. So you just need to put the right numbers in here and it's one line, simple calculation. So this existence of low intersecting families implies actually that we can solve the problem of assigning a candidate set such that neighboring nodes intersect in few elements and candidate sets are large. We can solve it in zero rounds if we're given an input coloring. And this is, enough to show this one round color reduction. Now, before we continue and talk about list coloring and all of this, uh, let me just summarize this on one slide. So we have this linear color reduction that we want to solve. We have a one round process. If we solve this problem of assigning candidate sets, we can do this without communication by hard coding. Okay, so let me now continue with presenting the, these two uh, linear and delta algorithms and the slight variation. This. Why do I have these in this talk? Well, for one reason, I wanted to get a grasp at least on most of the algorithms in this area here. And second, you can obtain them with a slight variation of what we've already seen. And third, and which is most important, I want you to understand this final part three of this algorithm with almost all details. And the slight variation of these two algorithms is also uh, used in the third part. So let's look at the first linear and delta algorithm, which is based on defective coloring. So a D-defective P coloring is a partition of the vertices into P parts, such that each part induces a graph of maximum degree at most D. So you can think of it's a coloring where you have at most D neighbors that have the same color as you. And the following algorithm is by Kuhn from roughly 10 years ago and Barenboim and Elkin have found an alternative, different algorithm to compute such uh, defective colorings at the same time. 
independently. So this algorithm is basically the same algorithm as before. Each node has a candidate color set. And now instead of just picking a color which is not used by any of your neighbors as a candidate, you tolerate up to D neighbors who use this color as a candidate set. As a result, you can choose the parameters in the slow intersecting family differently. And you get basically the same result as Vignette's color reduction. But now this delta squared term actually becomes a delta over D squared term, where this D is the defect of the color. This is everything I want to say about this algorithm. Now you obtain this linear and delta algorithm by applying this recursively to partition the graph in a divide and conquer style into graphs of smaller degree. A different algorithm, which is, in my opinion, simpler and also has a linear run, also has a linear runtime, and this goes through so-called low intersecting sequences. It's not written in the paper by the low intersecting sequences, but this is my personal view on this topic. And to understand this, we first uh, should take a look at low intersecting families again. And one way how you can get these low intersecting families. You can do the greedy proof that I showed you before, but another one, and that is also taught in many courses, is you can get these low intersecting families via polynomials, meaning you fix the prime and consider the, yeah, the finite field over this prime. And then what you need to do is you just need to assign each vertex one polynomial so that different vertices get different polynomials. So basically, again, you here you have a hard coding input color to polynomials. Each input color is a different polynomial. And then from such a polynomial, you just define the set. This is the definition up here. You just evaluate this polynomial at each point and consider the tuple of x, comma pv of x. And because two polynomials can only intersect of yeah, here in this example, I have degree three, they can only intersect in at most uh, three elements here. In this example, what I constructed here, the intersection of any two of these sets would be at most three. And yes, so for the hard coding to work, what you need to do is you need to choose the prime and the degree of the polynomials such that uh, the number of polynomials you have is more than, num than the number of input colors that you have to begin with. But now I don't want to talk about uh, how we can use these polynomials to construct these low intersecting sets, but I want to consider a different object that you can immediately get from these. And this is what I call a low intersecting sequence. So instead of writing the set as these tuples, x comma pv of x, you can also write just the evaluation of the polynomial as a sequence. So pv of zero, pv of one, so a sequence of q elements. And then two of these sequences for different polynomials intersect in at most three positions, if three is the degree of our polynomial. And this now gives us a very simple algorithm, which is linear in uh, delta rounds, if this Q can be chosen linear in delta. So think of this Q to be linear in delta. And this way you get a very simple algorithm, which given a delta squared coloring, computes an order of delta coloring in linear and delta rounds. The algorithm says follows, you just assign each node such a color sequence. So again, you have hard coding input color to polynomial. From this, you immediately get this color sequence. And from this color sequence on, the algorithm is very simple. You just, if you're still uncolored, you just try in the eyes round, you try the eyes entry of your color sequence. You keep your color if there's no conflict with any neighbor meaning no neighbor tries the same color in the same round. And you also don't have a neighbor which is already colored with this color. So why does this work? Well, you have these low intersecting sequences. So you have at most three intersections with a neighbor. So you have at most three conflicting rounds per neighbor, which is still alive. And after a node has terminated one of your neighbors, you can think of it as it just has a constant polynomial, for example, like the polynomial uh, that I stick to color five. And then again, after the vertex has terminated, you also just have at most three conflicting rounds. 
So in total, you have six conflicting rounds at most per neighbor. So if the number of rounds that you try this, so if your Q is chosen larger than six times the number of neighbors, larger than six times delta, you have a round without a conflict and you get covered in one of these rounds. So basically this is one slide and you have a linear and delta algorithm here. And now what we need for our final algorithm is the variation of this and we want to make this defective. So what we can think of, we just try to do the same as before to compute defective coloring. How about we also have these color sequences and now if you're uncolored you try a color and now you don't just accept if there's no conflict with a neighbor but you tolerate let's say up to better conflicts. What do we get now? Do we get a defective coloring? Well no because the thing is for example consider one node it terminates at this point where it terminates, it has few other nodes with the same color. But what can happen is that some of its neighbors are still alive and they later terminate and pick the same color. So a later node, which terminates later a neighbor, can destroy your conflict. So what we actually get here is not a defective coloring, but what we can do, we can do a slight variation of this. When you terminate, and then orient your edges towards your conflicting neighbors, then what you get is not a defective coloring, but a better out degree coloring. Meaning you get a partition, each part of this partition is one color class, plus an orientation of the edges, such that in each part, you have an out degree of at most better because when you terminate, you have at most better other neighbors with that color and you orient these edges towards these neighbors. Later, you will never have, no, none of the edges will later be oriented outwards from you. It can only happen that someone else also picks the same color later, but then they will consider you as their out neighbor and orient the edge towards you. So this is a slight variation and it's a, simplification of an algorithm which uh, Aaron Baum, Elkin and Goldenberg presented in their POTSI paper. So, and this one will be important in our final algorithm in the end. So what we can do is with, I think this slight variation of these low intersecting sets uh, to low intersecting sequences. And then instead of trying this at the same time, just iteratively going through the sequence. So given a delta squared coloring, we can compute the better out degree partition. And the number of colors that we use is delta over beta. And yeah, we use order of the number of color rounds. This P maybe should have been the Q up here because this Q is exactly the right time. So this result here shows how you can uh, pick these parameters. So for example, if you set beta to be square root of delta, then you can compute such an out degree coloring, out degree square root of delta into square root of delta parts. So this is what, I, what I've told you about. We will use it later in the third part. But for now, let's come to the main technical contribution of our paper. And this is actually a list color variant of Daniel's color reduction. And I like to call this part linear for lists because it's a list coloring equivalent of linear color reduction. So what are the main differences to this linear color reduction? Well, we, first of all, we start list coloring now. So instead of linear where everyone can pick the color from the whole color space as the output color. No, every node has a list of available colors LV and the output color of node V has to be a color in this color list LV. Then we have, we still have this delta squared here and now this is a lower bound on the size of the list of each color. And we have a small difference here in the polylogs that we have here, but this is not really important for this talk, except for maybe that we have 
some dependence on the global color space in which these lists live. And then one big difference is that we have two rounds instead of one round. So if we want to solve this problem, we would like to do just the same as linear. So we just want to have, stick to the same simple algorithm. We want to assign each node a candidate color set, and then you pick a color which is not the candidate of one of the neighbors. So what changes now, you cannot pick this candidate color set from the whole color space, but it has to be a subset of your own list because the output color has to be in your own list. And in this setting, we cannot just hard code such a, use such a low intersecting family to just hard code it because then it might be that your candidate color list does not intersect with your list of available colors. So can we still somehow solve this problem? Can we do something else? Can we solve this problem in zero rounds that everyone picks a candidate set, which is a subset of its own list? It turns out that we cannot solve this without communication and one can prove this. But what we can do, and this is what we do in our paper, we can use the same approach to solve actually this problem. So, and what do I mean by the same approach? Before in linear color reduction, we had one candidate set of colors for each vertex. Now we have a higher order version of this, which means, in fact, we have a candidate family of many candidate sets for each vertex. And then you use one round of communication to actually select a candidate set which satisfy the requirements of the problem up here. So let's look at the algorithm. So the algorithm now has two rounds. And the first round, and this is what we will solve magically without communication again, everyone gets a family of sets of candidate sets. And the families of adjacent vertices fit nicely together such that in this family of many candidate sets, you just learn the families of your neighbors and then pick one of these sets, which has a low intersection with all the possible candidate sets of all your neighbors. So it's a higher order version of the same algorithm. Once you have your SV, the list of candidate colors, you just do the same as before. You learn the SWs of your neighbors and select a color which is not a candidate by any of your neighbors. So this linear for list is just like the standard linear color reaction, but it's two rounds and where the first round is a higher order version of this. So let's look at these side by side. So in linear color reduction, we want to compute this delta squared coloring. Here we want to have delta squared list coloring. And we can solve both of these in one round of communication if we give each node a candidate set such that adjacent candidate sets do not have a small intersection and are large enough. In linear color reduction, we can solve this problem without communication, just hard code input colors to candidate sets. It doesn't work for list coloring, but here we can give each vertex a family of candidate sets. So every vertex has many families, and this is a problem which we can again solve magically without communication. So I won't have a slide on the proof here of how do we obtain this family, because the definition of the family is a bit technical, but uh, yeah, I think you get the message and which objects you deal with. If I already just tell you it's a higher order version of this low intersecting set families. And we also find it greedily by picking a family, getting rid of all the families that don't work together with it, picking the next family, getting rid of all families that don't work with it. One crucial difference here is that we cannot just search greedily in the space of all families, but we first restrict the search space to a suitable space. So we restrict the search space by only looking at certain families, and then we greedily find such a family, low intersecting candidate family here. So now let me tell you how what we've seen, this linear for list is helpful to actually color with uh, delta plus one colors, even so linear for list uses many more colors. And first, what we need to notice here is that if you have a graph and each of the edges is oriented, then you can replace the maximum degree bound delta 
by the outlook rebound better if you slightly adjust the algorithm. Instead of, and this works for linear color reduction and also for linear for lists. So for linear color reduction, if you only look at your out neighbors and make sure that you don't pick one of the candidates of your out neighbors, then you will also obtain a valid covering because each edge, one of the endpoints will make sure to not pick a candidate of the other side. So if we have a graph with a small out degree, then we're fine. And we've already seen that we can compute the partition of the graph into several parts and each part has a small out degree. And these ingredients now are sufficient to actually get our result of roughly square root delta runtime. And the algorithm fits onto this slide. So it works as follows. We first compute the delta squared coloring. This is using Lenin's algorithm, takes log star of n rounds. And afterwards, we compute a better out degree partition into roughly square root delta parts. Then we iterate through the parts, and in each iteration, we color some of the vertices, some remain uncolored. This means when we are at part vi, we need to solve a list coloring problem because some of your neighbors in previous parts might already be colored and you don't want to pick one of their color. So you remove these from your list of available colors and you solve a list coloring problem. And then the algorithm is just very simple as follows. You just take all the nodes which have a large enough list. Large enough here means at least this 10 beta squared times log beta. This is exactly the condition for this linear for list algorithm. All the vertices with a large enough list apply in for list. What do you gain from this? Well, after you are done with all the iterations and all the vertices which didn't pick a color, they didn't satisfy this large list condition, meaning they have a small list. They have a list of size, and this comes from the choice of Pythagoras, of at most delta half. How can you obtain a small list? You can only obtain a small list if one of your neighbors gets color, because otherwise you don't least lose the color from your list which means you have at most delta over half uncolored neighbors. So in one of these iterations, we've half the uncolored degree. So then we can recurse. For technical reasons, because the color space doesn't change, we have to do a cleanup phase uh, at the end and we cannot recurse until the uncolored degree is constant, but this is just a technical detail. And the runtime here is really dominated by the first iteration. So by the number of parts here in the first iteration, this is where the runtime is square root delta times square root log delta comes from. So now let me conclude. First of all, I want to ask, are these low intersecting families that we considered here, these higher order objects, are these the right objects? And I think they at least live in the right universe. And what do I mean by this? For that, we need to talk a little bit about the related topic, which is called speed up. So consider this problem that we want to solve here. What we did in this work or in this talk is we constructed the so-called upper bound sequence. We constructed a sequence of problems until we reach a trivial problem, one which we can solve without communication. And the sequence is such that from a later problem, you can solve the one before just with one round of communication. So for our linear color reduction, this sequence just had two problems and the trivial problem was just assigning these candidates. For linear for list, this was a sequence with uh, three problems. But the more interesting part is that there's also the concept of a lower bound sequence introduced by this paper uh, by Brandt and has been used a lot to show many lower bounds in the area now. And this is very similar. You also define a sequence of problems. But now the goal is to reach a problem which is where you can prove that it's not trivial. And you want that the problem pi plus one is at least one round easier than pi. Because then from obtaining that pt is non-trivial, you can obtain a lower bound and deduce that p0 cannot be solved in two rounds. For more information, there was a long and great talk by Sebastian uh, at last year's article. And the interesting part here is that if you apply this method, because actually one can compute these problems, P0, P1, P2, 
also mechanically. This paper by Brunt gives a mechanical way to even let a computer compute these problems or give you these problems. And if you do this, these problems that you get here, which perfectly characterize, char characterize the complexity of the graph kernel problem, they live in the exact same universe as our families that we consider here to solve the current problem. This is what I find uh, very nice, and I think there is a lot of work that needs to be done here to understand this interplay and the complexity of this problem better. Now, before I go to open problems, I just want to say a few more words about our paper here. First, message size is every node actually just has to send one non-congest message. Everything else is congest. And this non-congest message is just a subset of the Cairo space. So this is like a subset of its own list. So this is much better than previous work where the message size was really huge and I'm down it in this friend of Heinrich and Kuzowski paper. As a downside, compared to their work, we have some dependency on the color space, but we can tolerate exponentially large color space or even more. We didn't write this even more, but the approach extends to also larger color spaces. And then uh, also this kuhn wattenhofer paper, which computed these defective colorings, we can do the same trick and get defective list coloring. So defective coloring where each vertex has to pick a color from its list. And one very interesting aspect of our algorithm is that we do not use IDs. And by our algorithm, I mean the actual delta plus one coloring in the end. So we do not use IDs after computing the initial order of delta squared coloring. What I didn't put on here, of course, like this whole algorithm here, it doesn't just work for delta plus one coloring, but we also get this roughly square root delta runtime for degree plus one list coloring here. No change is needed, actually. So let me conclude with some open problems. And the first open problems are, of course, lower bounds for coloring. And uh, any lower bound that is better than log star is an open problem. And it's even open to match this log star lower bounds for large degree graphs. So if you know that delta is log n, we don't know any log star lower bound, log star n lower bound. Note that if delta is log star n, you can in a constant number of rounds compute the delta to the three coloring. And as a side remark here about techniques, also this log star lower bound by linear, this famous lower bound, is based on the same speed up technique, actually, at least in hindsight one can see. There are a lot more open problems. We've seen this roughly square root delta algorithm, but it's only roughly square root delta. Can we remove this square root log delta term? I don't know. Is this square root delta a natural barrier? I don't know. Also in this F of n regime. But now that I just have these very generic solutions, do we have simple and meaningful algorithms for coloring at MIS? We have them for edge coloring, we have them for maximum matching. Not so much for coloring at MIS, I think. And there are also a lot of things that I didn't color, cover today. There's a lot more in this coloring. And yeah, let me not go into this, but rather give an like, indicator of which directions we should pursue in the future. I think we should understand this speed up much better. And not just for lower bounds, but also for upper bounds. But then also we should understand this list coloring. Understand this, how much does out degree versus degree matter? What's with the ID space? Can we actually use the ID space or is it equally power if we are given an initial coloring for, for to, to solve the coloring problem? And then also I think Yes, we can maybe do something and actually understand, and even so this sounds very trivial, to understand the set of problems that we can solve without communication. It might be helpful to actually design fast algorithms, as we've seen. So thanks a lot for listening to my talk. <laughs>